All right, good morning, and welcome to Genesis Church. Again, we're uh, online on Google. Uh, hopefully, you're with your family, and uh, you're going to watch, you're going to sing, you're going to take notes, and join in as much as you can for the service. Last week was great. I pray that you were able to make it out. We had the parking lot service for Easter. We had a great turnout and even though we didn't get out of our cars and we left the windows up, it was great to see familiar faces and just, you know, the looks in people's eyes. So we really don't have a lot of announcements because there's nothing going on in the church right now as far as here at the building or groups getting together. I do want to remind you about Facebook. If you need help, if you're able to help other people, you can go to our Facebook page and there's a, a way to notify people that you need help. There's a way to sign up to help people. You can also uh, text Brad or myself. Uh, it's really easy, first name, Brad or Mike, at svgenesis.org. And you can also text or, or email info at svgenesis.org. So what I'd like to do is just read a passage from Scripture. I hope you find it encouraging. And then I'm going to pray, and we're going to uh, begin our service with song. So I'm reading from Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. No matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens around us, we are secure in Christ and our hope in him, our hope of the resurrection, our hope of the new heavens and new earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have the technology that we can get together uh, even like this, and we can still worship, we can still be, in a sense, a body uh, those separated, there's a sense that we're unified. We know that others are watching online as we're watching online. Father, I pray for Brad as he brings the message to us today. I pray that you prepare hearts and that even now you would pour out your spirit upon your people, that they would be changed from this message and they would go forth new, encouraged, knowing that they're loved and with the hope of the resurrection primary on their hearts and minds for we ask all this in Christ Jesus so let's let's begin our service with song
Good morning. When I, uh, when I was a pastor in Alabama, we, uh, we were part of a, a wonderful church down there, and there was a man in our church, his name was A.J., and uh, he taught our Sunday school class, and he was an evangelist and, and loved the Lord, but he had, uh, one of the things to notice about him, his hand seemed a little bit unique looking. His left hand looked kind of odd, and I never asked him about it, but I did hear the story one time when he was teaching, and it was, um, it was a unique situation. He was in high school at the time, and he uh, was, he played basketball, he played football, and he was just a devout athlete. And he was playing uh, in the, the state tournament, the basketball tournament that was up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And so while he was there, you know, him and his teammates were uh, staying at the hotel and they were in the swimming pool. And while they were, you know, messing around as high school kids do, he got out of the pool and he was running back to his room. And when his friend was kind of racing him and, and he was out running his friend. And so his friend kind of bumped him a little bit, shoved him. And unfortunately, AJ kind of lost control and slid and fell through a plate glass window. And the weight of his body pushed his arm against some of the broken glass and completely severed his hand. And he remembers saying, um, my hand was laying there on the shag carpet. I'll never forget that picture of my hand there on the shag carpet. And he said, I immediately got up and I put it back on, kind of hoping and assuming that it would kind of reattach itself or something like that. But he held it there and uh, he said blood was just everywhere, as you can imagine, all the arteries severed and such. And uh, his friends were all kind of in shock. Nobody knew what to do. Well, he remembered there was a hospital about three blocks away. And so he said, let's, let's run to the hospital, guys. And so he started jogging to the hospital. And you can imagine the amount of blood lost. He didn't make it very far, just a couple blocks. And then sat down on the curb and soon passed out. When he was revived again or came back, he was now laying in a hospital bed, a tourniquet on his arm, and his hand was on a table. And he heard the doctor, and the doctor was just coming off his shift, and uh, he was the head surgeon there, and he's the only one that could have done really anything. But that doctor was talking to some of the other doctors and mentioned something about a prosthetic, and AJ didn't know what that was at the time, but didn't take long to figure out that they weren't going to try to revive his hand. And so he leaned up with all the strength and grabbed him with his good arm, grabbed him by his white coat and said, you put that hand back on, sir. It'll please try. Please try to do it. And then he passed out again. Well, he woke again, and his hand was all bandaged up, attached in a cast, but just worthless. The doctor had attached an artery, and so that blood was still flowing through the hand. Well, AJ's mom was also a nurse, and she got in a car and was immediately driving up to Alabama or Tuscaloosa. And while she was, uh, you know, she had talked to one of the doctors at her hospital, and that doctor had told her about a hand specialist, one of the best in the nation that wasn't too far from where they lived, and so. Uh, they, you know, she got him out of that hospital and took him to this hand specialist. And over the next four years, after I think seven different surgeries, his hand was uh, functional again. Certainly not everything was reattached and, and fully functional, but it was, a, it was a reattached hand. In fact, his was, uh, from, what I, from what he said, the second ever re successful re-hand attachment surgery that had been done. Well, during one of the surgeries, he asked the doctor, he said, do you think I'll be able to play football next year? And the doctor gave him a, an odd look and said, son, you'll never play football again. And AJ looked at him and said, you're a liar. And uh, well, it turns out the very next year, AJ played football for the team. They wrapped his hand up in thick, heavy um, foam and bandages. And AJ would he'd take a Sharpie and write the club. And he called it the club. And, and he played, played, played a different position now. I think he was playing um, uh, playing on the line, but, but he'd use his arm as a club. In fact, after the trainers would, would wrap it when nobody was watching, him and his teammates would slide rebar into the, into the cast, and he would use that you know, and, and, and hit people with this club and you know, take it out before anybody would um, you know, unwrap his hand. But, uh, but he got to play football again. In fact, the, after he graduated from high school, he went to the University of Alabama. And this was, uh, you know, he didn't get into scholarships or anything, but, but he tried out for the team as a walk-on, and he made the team. He played third string and played under Bear Bryant for a few years as, you know, a football player for the University of Alabama. Well, he told the doctor one day, you know, uh, you know seeing again, he said, you told me I'd never play football again. The doctor chuckled and said, well, you'll never play handball at least. And then AJ didn't even know what handball was, but again, he figured out what it was and started to play handball and started to play it quite competitively and played with some of the best in the nation playing handball. And uh, again, the, the whole story is a, a testimony to um, the, the human spirit and, and the drive that we have. And, uh, you know, right now, if you knew him, you, you'd hardly even notice because he doesn't, doesn't let him hold him back from anything. 
We were watching a show just the other day about the girl that uh, had her arm bit off by the shark, you know, the surfing girl, the soul surfer. And this was a documentary of when she's an adult as a mom and married and such. And she's, again, competing on uh, the top levels of, of women surfing and, um, and just, you know, holding her own with all of them. And again, the people that suffer these kind of setbacks uh, oftentimes show great drive and determination to overcome and, and, and do what people say you can't do. In fact, it's, it's such a part of our nature to, when someone tells us we can't do something, we're going to do everything we can to do it, and especially in America where we celebrate those kind of stories. Well, we're looking at a story this morning where Jesus tells somebody they can't do something. Now, sometimes when people tell us that we can't do something, of course we want to rise above it. But other times when people tell us we can't do something, that desire to rise above it could actually be a hindrance. And that's the case here. And it's hard for Jesus', you know, the guy he's having a conversation with to grasp this. And this is what Jesus has to say. It's in the story of, uh, story of Nicodemus. It's in John chapter 3. And by the way, we're doing these videos, and I, who knows how many more we're going to do before we get to be back here again together at church. But as you're watching with your family, please have a Bible with you, whether it's, you know, a, a paper, you know, paper Bible or whether it's on your phone. But follow along and read along as we, we look at this. In John chapter 3, this is the story. There is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's come from or where it's going. So is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you earthly things and you would not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked, wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light, so that he may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is just such a great passage. It's the passage in which, of course, one of the most well-known Bible verses, probably one of the most important Bible verses in all of Scripture, John 3.16, is found. But as we look at this whole story, as we evaluate it, as we're going through this series on fear versus faith, we're, we're looking at this notion and this idea of what, um, what Jesus is, is teaching us through this whole time. We've been looking at the story of John amid all the COVID-19 uh, dilemma and, and quarantine and such, and as we're looking at this, this fear versus faith, you know, that there are a number of things to be afraid of, but, but how do we live as people of faith? And how is that different from how the rest of the world looks at this whole thing? And as we've been going through different stories in the book of John, we find this, um, this reality again and again that Jesus is the answer. That Jesus is the one who solves the problem of fear. Because Jesus has real solutions for our deepest and greatest fears. And as we look at this passage this morning, the thing that comes out of it, the thing that jumps out of it to me, and I hope to you, is that Jesus is the hope, our only hope for salvation. Jesus is our only hope to be delivered and rescued. And as Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus, that very much is is what Jesus is trying to communicate to this guy who was a scholar. He was so well-known, so well-recognized by everybody as a scholar, but he's not grasping the things that Jesus is trying to say. And I want to start out this idea by, by asking you to reevaluate 
your understanding of spiritual matters. Even if you have been a Christian your whole life, it, you know, I, I was born into a you know, pastor's home. I have learned the Bible early on. I've known a Bible all my life. But it's so easy, especially for us who grew up in, in religious homes or Christian homes where we tend to assume some things, assume that we're believers because maybe someone said we were or we had some experience, and yet maybe we aren't really. And I just want to challenge you to evaluate that as we look at this. Really uh, ask yourself, what does Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection mean to me? Well, the first thing we see in this story is a talk about a new birth. That there is a new birth, which the whole thing sounds odd. Now, it starts out with Nicodemus. We we're told about Nicodemus. He shows up about three times in the book of John. In fact, we talked about him just a week or two ago as we were covering the story of the crucifixion on Good Friday. And Jesus was buried by two men, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And it's interesting that John reiterates that, well, Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple and Nicodemus came to him by night. And it, both a picture of two men that weren't quite ready to risk the political clout of being public disciples of Jesus. They believed in him. They were learning about him. They were interested in him. But up until his crucifixion, they were hidden disciples. And this is what John points out here, that Nicodemus came to him by night. Now, there may have been different reasons why he came to him at night. Maybe it was just the only time Jesus had a, could have had a private conversation. But it seems that Nicodemus was trying to have this conversation with Jesus without everybody knowing that Nicodemus was interested in what Jesus had to say. And he comes to Jesus, and, and the Bible says he was a Pharisee. This is a, one of the top religious leaders of the time, and he was a ruler of the Jews. He was well-respected by people as somebody who had authority in, in Israel, Jerusalem, and so on. But not only that, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel meaning that Nicodemus was a teacher to the teachers. He was a rabbi to the rabbis. He was the, you know, kind of the, the college professors or the, the you know, PhDs that taught everybody else about how to teach. So Nicodemus was a highly educated man. And when he came to Jesus, he gives Jesus some wonderful compliments. He calls him a rabbi, which for Nicodemus to call somebody else a rabbi or a teacher was a, a, to, a, a term of great respect. And he says that we know you've come from God. Now he says we. Who the we is, we don't know. Uh, probably himself and a handful of other people in the Sanhedrin that see Jesus as something that is more than just a fly-by-night kind of popular teacher. That Jesus has something more to offer. And as he talks to him... Uh, Again, Nicodemus is having this conversation. Now, why exactly all this is going on? I tend to think that, uh, that G Nicodemus may be having kind of one of those meeting before the meetings. You know, sometimes you have a public meeting, you make a statement, but you've got to have those meetings before the meetings. My people will talk to your people and so on. And this may have been one of those times where Nicodemus is trying to feel Jesus out and make sure that there's a, an understanding between some of the religious leaders of Israel and, and Jesus. And again, this is very early in Jesus' ministry, so this may have been one of those meetings where they're trying to figure out and we'll endorse you if you endorse us kind of a thing. But Nicodemus, after he says this, Jesus doesn't hold back. Jesus has been called a teacher. Jesus is going to teach. And he starts out by saying his, his famous truly, truly statements. He says this a handful of times. When the Bible repeats itself, it's a way of saying exponentially true. You know, truly, truly. It's true to the tenth power kind of true. This is utterly true. And the first thing Jesus says to him is that nobody can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And this is a this is an odd statement for Nicodemus to hear. This was not something he was expecting to come out of Jesus' mouth. But Jesus says, unless anybody is born again, they can't see the kingdom. Now, being born again may have been a, a term that Nicodemus was somewhat familiar with. It wasn't uncommon for Jews at the time to look at people who are on the outside of Israel coming in as kind of being born into a new family and born uh, again, so to say. That these people who hadn't been born in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were now being privileged to be brought into a new family. And so the term might have been somewhat familiar to Nicodemus, but he immediately dismisses it because that would be true of somebody who's a Gentile, so not somebody who's a Jew, certainly not of somebody like him. But he, uh, and so he, he lets Jesus know, um, can a man be born, you know, he can climb back into his mother's womb. That's ridiculous. And he, he lets Jesus know that he's kind of talking nonsense. 
But Jesus, again, comes back at him and tells him these things. I'm telling you the truth, that nobody can enter into the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. What does it mean to be born again? Well, it could be translated born from above. Either way, it's, it's a, a new birth. Now, that term may not be uh, well respected. In fact, a lot of people talk about there's you know, normal Christians and those born again Christians. Those born again Christians are kind of fanatical. They actually like read the Bible like they're reading a magazine. They, they, they just kind of over the top kind of born again. But that's certainly not what Jesus meant. Any true Christian, of course, is a born again Christian. You think about what it means to be born again. Uh, you know, when you're born, there's so much of your life that is determined by your birth. Things that you had no control over. You know, of course, being born in the culture that you were born into. We're born in the United States, and, and we have uh, an understanding of our culture. But if you were born in a very different culture, your personality, your life, everything would be so vastly different. Maybe you were born in, in India, or born in China, or born in some little village in Africa. Your life would be very, very different than if you'd been born in you know, the United States. Not only culture, but also time. If you'd been born 100 years ago or 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, how different your life would be. In a culture like the Jews and and Middle Eastern cultures, birth, order, and and, and things that were determined by your birth had a lot more significance. We try in in America to downplay that, but in other cultures, that was a very important thing. You know, you, you couldn't serve in any priestly role unless you were born into a certain tribe, and then even into a certain family. Of course, there's royal descent and and, uh, different families, different tribes and inheritance all had to do with birth order. You know, if you were the firstborn versus the secondborn, your life was very, very different. There's so much about what we're born into that um, that affects who we are. Even in America, you know, the family you're born into determines and shapes so much of your personality and your development. Also, what opportunities you may have, what your parents were like, and, and their level of maybe education or experience will shape who you are and, and what opportunities you have. Not only that, of course, just your sheer appearance, what color your hair, what color your eyes, the shape of your body, your height, natural abilities and talents. So many things are affected by our birth. And then determine, you know, based on, on how important that is to you, to think about being born again may be a very welcome thing or it may be a very terrifying thing. You know, if you've kind of messed up your life in so many ways and you would love a fresh start, that may be a welcome thing. But for someone certainly like Nicodemus who had accomplished so much and achieved a level of notoriety, achieved a level of success, achieved a level of power, the thought of starting over is, would not be a welcome thought. It would be something that would have been somewhat repulsive especially when you're talking about being put on the same level of the people that he's so much higher than right now. Certainly the Gentiles, you know, the, a, a proselyte coming in it would have been somebody that he certainly wouldn't have been on, want to be on the same level with. But then to start over, you know, if you've ever started something new, maybe uh, start a new career, start a new hobby or, or some kind of new club or a new sport or something and you go and, and you realize you don't know anything. You've got no credibility. You've got no respect by the people who are already advanced, people who've already been in it for a few years. And there's there's a humbling aspect of it. You know, the brunt of jokes or being the novice or being the freshman or being somebody who just doesn't have the understanding. The idea of becoming born again would have been so difficult for somebody, especially in a religious sense, like Nicodemus, to understand. The Apostle Paul was somebody who wrestled with those same questions. And again, if you have a Bible... Take a look at Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 3. There's Paul talking about what it meant to surrender all of these things when he, was, um, when he became a believer. Philippians chapter 3, verse, verse 4. Paul, he's talking about himself. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh... I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says there, I had everything. As far as anybody concerned, as far as any respectable position in Israel, I was the up-and-comer. I was the one that everybody looked to. I was the poster child of the future of the nation of Israel. And I counted all as garbage. You see, for Paul, once he realized what he was gaining by this new birth, everything that he had before was, was repulsive. It was something he had no desire to keep at all. Because what he got out of this new birth was such a welcome relief. No more trying to earn a right standing with God because that was so much work and it was so much effort and it was never, ever, ever enough. Sacrifices offered only temporarily covered sin, but when he found this new life in Christ, all of that was taken away. And not only that, he had a right standing with God and he had this relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what Christians talk about it again and again. I want to know Christ. Paul's saying here, I get to know Christ. The new birth gave me a new life in ways that is insurmountably better, incomparably better. It was so much more superior than everything I'd ever worked for in my life, That so much so that everything I had before is just garbage. Everything that I used to hold on to that was so valuable is, is a repulsive trash now, and I want nothing to do with it. You see, when we're born again, there's a new life that, that is given to us. You know, we were just talking about being born into a family, and Jesus says this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. When you're born into one family, you have those opportunities, but you have a lot of constraints. But you get to be born into a new family, born of the Spirit. You're born into God's family, and if God's your father, and you're an heir of, of all that God has to offer, what in the world could cause you to say, this is so much better than this? And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to Nicodemus. He wants him to understand this. And it takes Nicodemus, it's, he's got to shake him. You see, you and I, at times, really need to be shaken and, and understand what God is trying to communicate to us. Especially, again, if you grew up in a Christian home where you're, you're raised in it, you understand it, and, and Jesus is trying to shake us up a little bit and say, wait a minute, that's, you may not understand it. You may not get it. Martin Lloyd-Jones um, He's writing a book. It was an interesting book called Spiritual Depression. And he's talking and he's kind of anticipating the arguments. He's communicating something about sin. And he's anticipating people responding to him. This is what he says. Quote, are you going to preach to us about sin? Are you going to preach to us about conviction of sin? You say your object is to make us happy. But if you're going to preach to us about conviction of sin, surely that is going to make us still more unhappy. Are you deliberately trying to make us miserable and wretched? To which the simple reply is yes. <laughs> the simple thing I'm trying to do is help you to understand how wretched and miserable you are. Because only by understanding how wretched and miserable you are because of sin will you truly understand how grateful you will be, how joyful you will be when you have deliverance, when you have a new life, when you have something being offered to you. Arthur Pink puts it this way. Here then is the character of the nature of the new birth. It is not the reformation of the outward man, it is not the education of the natural man. It is not the purification of the old man. It is the creation of a new mind, a new man. It is the creation of something entirely new. That when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, there's a whole new start and it is a welcome start. It's not a, I'm letting go of all the credibility I used to have. I'm letting go of all the things that I had going for me. We're getting rid of all the things that held us back. And there's freedom and there's joy. And Jesus is trying to help Nicodemus get it. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't understand and Jesus compares the movement of God to, to like the wind. That the wind moves. You know, we understand wind somewhat, more so certainly now than they did back then. And it may have very well been that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus on a dark and stormy night. Jesus may have say, been talking about the wind outside. That the wind blows where it wishes. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. You don't know what causes wind. We understand that a little bit more now, but, but we certainly don't understand it all, nor can we control it. And sometimes the wind is very gentle. Sometimes the wind is very harsh. There are times we'd love to have more wind or less wind, but we don't get to determine those things. We can do our best to harness it. We can do our best to protect ourselves from it. But wind is going to do what's going to do. And, and as the Spirit moves, sometimes He moves gently. Sometimes He moves powerfully. Sometimes He moves um, in ways that you would have never expected, but that's the work of God in hearts. 
And so as we are talking about this and looking at this, how is the Spirit moving in your heart? How is the Spirit moving in you in this whole COVID-19? How is God moving in you? Is He whispering something? Is He blowing a, a harsh wind on your soul? Is He trying to communicate and get your attention? Is He shaking you up? Well, that's what Jesus does here with this, with this event with Nicodemus. The second thing that we, Jesus moves to is the plague of sin. Now, again, Nicodemus doesn't get this, and Jesus has to confront him and says, um, verse 10, Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, Jesus, again, goes on. He, he talks about, you know, no one's ever been to heaven. No one ascended to heaven and came back to tell you what heaven is about. But I came down. I've come from heaven to declare these things to you. And he says, you're the teacher of Israel. You know, Jesus, as he's working with people, he's very gentle with people who need, need gentleness. But he's very harsh with those who should know better. You know, with the Pharisees and teachers and, and other religious leaders, Jesus didn't hold back. And he debated them and put them to shame as they tried to trap him in various things. And Jesus here confronts Nicodemus and says, you're the teacher of Israel. You're the one who's supposed to understand these things and you're not getting it. How in the world am I going to teach you anything more if you can't understand some of these basic principles? And, and Nicodemus, may, maybe the, tr the new birth wasn't taught so much in the Old Testament, which is what he would have had access to, but it was certainly taught in lots of pictures and lots of ways. And Jesus here is about to give him an example that can help him kind of wrap his mind around it. But as Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he says three very important words. He says, understand, receive, and believe. He says, how, can, how, how is it that you're the teacher of Israel and you don't even understand this? And then he says, you know, we know what we're talking about, who the we is, maybe Jesus and John the Baptist, maybe Jesus and the disciples, I'm not sure. But he says, we do know what we're talking about and you don't receive our testimony. And then he says, you know, if I've taught you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I teach you heavenly things? So understand, receive, and believe. And that seems to be three levels or, or movements by which we get to understand what God is doing and, and how we move from being, um, well, how we move into understanding how we can become uh, believers, how we can become saved, how we can have a new birth. You see, for Nicodemus, he needed to understand. You see, understanding is simply grasping mentally what's going on. What is the gospel actually about? Even if you don't believe it, even if you don't even accept it as true, you can at least understand concepts. And we have this Throughout any number of things, you're watching a movie. You just want to understand what's going on. You know it's fiction, but you actually understand it. When it comes to the gospel, even if you don't believe, you've got to understand it. You see, what the gospel is is that we've sinned. Sin is the problem. And as we have sinned and caused all kinds of problems, we need God to teach us and help us understand. And the only way in which we can uh, come before God is if our sin is really dealt with. And if our sin is dealt with, then we have a way to approach God. But sin couldn't be dealt with with anybody other than a perfect sacrifice, and that was Jesus Christ. And he came as our substitute. He came and took on sin so that we didn't have to be punished for our own sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, that's Jesus, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That God is moving in our hearts and he wants us to understand. And that's the first part of how the Spirit moves as he helps us to understand things. In uh, John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. The Holy Spirit moves, blows into our heart blows into our mind and gives us the ability to comprehend and understand things. But not just understand, but also to receive. That was the second thing. To receive means, do I believe it's actually true? It's one thing if I understand, uh, you know, some historical document, maybe, maybe about the, the Pantheon and Zeus and the Greek gods. It's one thing to understand what's going on. It's a whole other thing to believe it. And the same is true when it comes to Christianity, of course, the real truth that we may understand things about Jesus, but do we actually believe it as actually true? Was Jesus Christ really God's son? Did he really die on the cross in order to pay for sins? Was he really raised from the dead three days later? Is he really the savior of the world? And then the next step, the most important step, is not just to only believe that it's true, but to, I'm sorry, not to just receive that it's true, but to believe it. And to believe it puts it in a whole other level because then it goes from understanding 
and, and, and receiving it as true, but now it's applied to my own life. Now it is actually my salvation, where I put my faith in Jesus Christ and say, I trust you. Now, Jesus clarifies it with a story. And it's a story Nicodemus had, would have heard and known his whole life. It's one of those stories, you know, little kids, Jewish kids heard the stories of, uh, you know, David and Goliath or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or Jonah and the fish. And this would have been one of those stories. And it's a story of the serpents in the wilderness. During Israel's time, after Moses had led them out of Egypt, you know, the parting of the Red Sea, they made it to the promised land. They decided not going to the promised land. They were too afraid. And so for the next generation, they all just had to wander through the wilderness for 40 years until that generation died off. During one of those times, they were whining and complaining. The, the manna, they were tired of it. The, the food that God had provided to feed them day after day, they were sick and tired of it. And the water they were drinking was not good water, and, and they were just whining. And they said, why did you take us out of Egypt just to make us die out here? They were blaming Moses. Everything was wrong, wrong, wrong. And they had done this kind of thing before, and each time God had sent some kind of plague or punishment to them. And so as God had done before, there's a plague. And the plague this time is a plague of snakes. And these are snakes that bit, and um, we don't know if they were brightly colored or their bite burned, but they were called fiery serpents. And the people were dying left and right. So many people were bit and they would die, and they, they realized they're wrong. God is disciplining us, and so they call Moses and say, We're sorry. Tell God we're sorry. Tell God to remove the snakes. And so Moses goes to God and prays to God and says, God, you know, please remove the snakes. And God does something different. You see, every time that there was a plague, you know, in Egypt and something, Moses would would be called by Pharaoh and Pharaoh would say, tell God to take it away. And God would take it away. But here, God doesn't take it away. Here, God leaves the snakes. Then that's different. And now God is is doing something different that the, the snakes are still around, but God's providing a remedy healing and he tells moses to make this bronze serpent and put it up on what's called a standard this is basically a banner holder a really high place to hold a banner and put it up there and it's it will be that anybody who gets bit by a snake when they look at it they'll be healed now this story is odd in so many ways because first of all it looks like idolatry and god was of course opposed to graven images and so on and you're telling us to look at this picture this this graven image of a serpent the other thing is you think about the stories of the Bible, and you think about a serpent, a snake, it immediately brings you back to the story of the Garden of Eden when, when Eve was tempted by the serpent to eat the forbidden fruit. And, and, you know, of all the things that anybody would look to for saving a, a serpent, you know, that serpent is the picture of sin. It's the one that introduced sin into our creation. It would have been very odd for them to look at. And, and finally, it would have been a kind of a ridiculous thing to do. I can imagine how many people would have said, that's a stupid idea. No, looking at some serpent isn't going to heal me. Suppose I came out or we came out as a church and said, we've got the cure for the coronavirus. If you get the coronavirus, you get COVID-19, we want you to look at a picture of, uh, you know, a scan of COVID-19 virus, you know, you know, some electron scan or whatever of the virus, and you'll have it for you on your phone. If you look at that, you're going to be cured. I mean, our church would be branded as ridiculous. It would be branded as, um, there'd be all kinds of memes about us. There'd be all kinds of things that people would just say, oh my gosh, those Christians are ridiculous. The scientific community would have laughed at us. That's kind of what God is telling Moses. Put this thing up on the pole, and whenever anybody looks at it, it may have been a cross for that, for all we know, whenever anybody looks at it, they're going to be healed. Now, and they were. And they looked at it, and they, whoever looked at it, they, all they had to do was look at it. They didn't have to bow down to it. They didn't have to gaze at it for hours. They didn't have to light incense to it. They didn't have to do anything. In fact, there was nothing magical about the serpent at all. In fact, later on in, in Israel's history, they actually worshiped the thing. They treated it as an idol, and Hezekiah, the king, had to smash it. Um, but the serpent itself wasn't anything magical. It was a amount of faith. Can I really trust what God says? I understand what he says, I may even believe that's what he's saying we ought to do, but it, until I actually look at that, I'm not really believing. I might believe that it could be true, but until I get bit and I'm scanning the horizon, where's that serpent on the pole? Until I actually fix my eyes on it, I haven't believed. And this is where Nicodemus needs to be. You may call me a teacher. You may call me a rabbi. You might even say I'm from God, but you haven't truly believed that I'm the one sent to deliver the world from their sins. And this serpent was a picture of me. It was a type of Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ was lifted up, as he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, the Son of Man must be lifted up. 
And the word actually implies glorified. But glorified on the cross, that when Jesus was put on the cross, that is the picture of sin. And all anyone has to do is look to that cross. And we're not talking about an actual cross. We're looking at a picture of uh, who Jesus Christ is. We're looking to Christ as the real remedy. That sin has bit us and God hasn't taken away sin. God hasn't removed the sting of sin or what Satan introduced at the Garden of Eden. Sin is still very much around and it's still painful and it's still deadly. And we can do everything we want and say, I can, I can solve it myself. I don't need anybody's help. I don't need God's help. I'm going to fix this myself. And God's saying, you cannot. You cannot solve sin. You cannot rescue yourself. You cannot be delivered. The only way is if you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. If you only put your eyes on him, then you'll have hope. Then you'll have deliverance. And that's what we're called here to do is Jesus talks to Nicodemus and tells him this. And um, uh, I'm going to finish with our third point, and that is uh, choosing light over darkness. This idea of believing, this idea of the serpent, this picture of um, the serpent up on the pole, is the introduction to one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. You know, we could arguably say the most important verse in the Bible, if you want to call it that way, but a succinct picture of the gospel. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then chapter uh, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. The picture of the new birth is, is this picture where Jesus is saying, I am the solution. And whether, you know, when, as it's written here when John wrote it, God loved the world so much. He loved you and I so much that he gave his only son. Now I can't imagine... Um, dying for somebody. If I, if I were to die for somebody, I certainly would die for anybody in my family. You know, well, probably, uh, <laughs> depending on what kind of mood I'm in. You know, you die for people that you love. If you ever had the opportunity you know, take a bullet for your child or, or for your spouse or for a brother or sister or a parent or something like that, that's one thing. But God loved the world so much that he gave his son. It's one thing for me to give my own life, but to give the life of my child for somebody else, never. Not, not even entered my mind. But not only that, it wasn't just for anybody, but for people like you and I. God loved us so much. And, and this was before we did anything right. This is before we did anything. Before we, God knew, you know, God didn't look at us and say, well, he's worthy for our, his life to be saved because he's a good guy. If anything, God would look at us and say, if anybody's not worthy, it's him. In fact, um, that's what the book of Romans says in Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Unrighteous, sinners, weak, all of these things. We had no reason that Christ would do this for us, but God loves us so much. God loved the world, you and I, so much that he gave his son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. I want you to understand. I want you to, to accept it. And I want you to believe that. I encourage you to, to think about this. Do I really understand what God is saying here? That he loved me so much that he wasn't trying to condemn the world. He wasn't trying to just point his finger at us and say, ha ha, you deserve hell. He loved us so much that he sent his son in order that the son would die in order to take our place. That the wrath of God for all of our sin would be poured out on Jesus and that Jesus took our place. And because of that, we can have eternal life. And this is the promise that Jesus is giving to us. This is the promise that Jesus came for that you and I, all we have to do is look to him and say, I need you to save me and rescue me and deliver me. Well, Jesus has much more to say to Nicodemus, much of which we don't have the time to really go through. But I do want to finish with a few points. Um, Jesus says in verse 18, or you know, whether it's Jesus or John writing this, I don't know. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. We love to talk about the love of God. We don't really like to talk about the judgment of God. But God is the one who's under obligation. He gave us the opportunity, and if we don't choose to accept that opportunity, what, uh, what does that tell God? And God says if we have rejected the Son, if we don't believe the Son, that we have been judged already. It's already been determined. And then he says that everybody who does these wicked things, he talks about light and darkness. 
How it is interesting. Nicodemus came to him at night. He came to him in the darkness and talked about that people love the darkness rather than the light. Because the darkness hides the things that we've done wrong. We're able to put off some level of credibility with the people around us. People respect us to some degree because in part they don't know what we really are like. And yet when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, in a sense we're, we're confessing everything, exposing everything. This is really the person I am. I am a sinful, wretched person. And I, I'm willing to admit that. I'm willing to admit that to God. I'm willing to admit that even publicly, that I need someone to help me. I need someone to rescue me. And that may be very hard for people to do because, again, you're starting all over. It's a new birth. But what you gain in the new birth so outweighs everything you're letting go of. It so outweighs everything that we are leaving behind. And this is the great promise that Jesus Christ gives to us that we can have a whole new life, a whole new birth that will make everything in our past, everything we had before without him, seem like garbage. So I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want to invite you, if you've never prayed a prayer like this, a prayer where you acknowledge that Jesus Christ really is God's son. And he really did come to earth in order to die for my sins and your sins. And that he was raised from the dead to believe that. That's one thing not only to understand, but to receive it as true. But then to really put your faith in it and say, I need you, I need Jesus to be my Savior. I need him, I, I declare he's my Lord. You're in charge. I give my life to you. I am, I'm, I'm tired of the old. I'm ready for a new change. That's what we're going to pray about. And if you'd like to ask Jesus to rescue you to give you a new birth a new life to be born again to to have this whole new start to take away your sin and give you a perfect standing with god that's what that's what we're offering as we pray this prayer so if you'd like to pray this prayer with me please do so right now and pray this between uh, obviously you and god dear god i admit it my sin is the real problem i've done all kinds of things against you that i'm ashamed of But I do believe that Jesus Christ is your son. And I believe he came to the earth to die for my sin. And I do believe he was raised from the dead. I ask that he be my Lord and my Savior today. Please give me a new start today, Lord. Bring me into your family. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, for the rest of us, as we are here, as we are gathered in our homes or wherever it is we're celebrating church, Father, I pray for our church to just have a sense in which we're together as spirit, together in spirit as the body of believers who are worshiping you. And Lord, I pray, I pray that this would end soon. I pray that your work would be done through this whole COVID-19 and the world scale of uh, of this quarantine and all that it's doing. We pray for your work to be done, but Lord, we do pray that it would end soon. We pray for our leaders to have the wisdom to know what to do. And uh, Lord, I pray for the church to respond in in whatever way you'd have us to respond. Open doors for us to be able to uh, represent you in our communities. Again, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to um, just... Uh, hear what you have to say. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to talk to you some more about it. You can uh, email me, brad at svgenesis.org. You can call the church. You can find all the information on our church website, svgenesis.org. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to finish our, uh, we're going to continue our service, I should say, by singing, and we invite you to join and sing with us. Thank you.
Thank you again for joining us. We hope you had a great time with us as we worshiped God and Jesus Christ this morning. Again, if you have any questions about Genesis Church, about some of the stuff we talked about, you can find out all more information on our website and reach out to any of us on, as a staff, and we'd love to answer any questions you have. Again, we invite you to take a hold, to take part in Right Now Media. Just text Right Now Genesis, the words Right Now Genesis, to 41411, and you have unlimited access to all the videos on there that our church uh, pays a subscription for. Also, if you'd like to continue to support Genesis Church, we uh, again, you can find all information on our website. But again, thank you so much, and we hope and pray that we get to be together soon. But God bless, and let us know if there's any way we can help you. Have a great week.